Welcome to the second installment of Tips from Teachers, and I hope that you were able to find our first installment of this. If you haven't, you can find it on our YouTube channel. But um, I am here with my friend Christy, and we are hoping that in the next 10 minutes, we can help you feel more confident and comfortable about working with your child at home and helping him or her with, with their learning right now. It's a challenge. I mean, for a lot of us, we're not used to what we're doing at home right now with our kids. And so we hope to give you some tools or some ideas or something to help you uh, get, get encouraged and feel more confident this week. And so I'm joined by my friend Christy Weatherly. Christy is a lifelong educator. She taught in primary grades for many years. 18 years. 18 years. <laughs> she was also a principal at Reeds Elementary School, which is my children's school, and she was my children's favorite principal. And so I'm and only principal. And only principal. <laughs> but you still would have been the favorite. There's no doubt about it. Um, we're going to share some tips with you today that, that hopefully will encourage you and, and help inspire you a little bit. And we're especially focusing today on reading and writing. Because when, it, when you come right down to it, if there's any one thing that all teachers really have to dig, in, dig their heels in on is reading and writing, is literacy. And for your kids at home, this may be the thing that is the most difficult to help them, to help them grow with. So, Chrissy, why is that? I mean, why do you think that reading and writing present such a challenge for, for parents, teachers, children? I think a lot of times children just need scaffolding and support and guidance. I think when they have that, they're able to grow as readers and as writers. And if we're there to be a facilitator and support them, we're able to help them transition through each step. Sort of like when you do your sermons, sometimes you have to get yourself going. Children are the same way. And one way we can do that is by front-loading them maybe with a story or prompt. So, so, so some way to, to help right. get them going. I mean, one thing, it, it occurs to me that when you're at home, it's a little bit different. I mean, when I, had a, when I was in the classroom, we had a routine. You know, I mean, the, every day was the same routine. It, it was very rare that we changed that. And so kids knew what to expect, and they would come in, and they would just follow the routine, right? So when it was time for to be quiet and read, they knew that. It, it was just scheduled as part of the day. It's harder at home. There's so many distractions and brothers and sisters right. and TV and neighbors, and before you know it, their minds are everywhere, right? The schedule can also help at home. I know mm -hmm. um, when you have a schedule at home, Children thrive on that. So when you have that already planned, then children know what to expect during each part of the day, and it just makes it easier for everybody. If every day at the same time, every hey, day at the same for, time. for this 20 minutes, we're just going to sit here and, and be still and read. Yes. I'm going to do it. You're going to do right. it. Boy, wouldn't that be powerful? Right. So what we're hoping to do today is give you maybe a way to to get into this, to, to front load your kids so that, that they can concentrate or maybe feel more empowered or encouraged to, to read or write. And I'm going to share a few ideas for older kids in just a minute, but Christy has brought a lesson, I should say Miss Weatherly, has brought a <laughs> lesson that, that you could do this very simple, especially with younger kids. Now, you could do something similar to what she's going to show you with all age kids, especially through elementary school, but she's going to, she's going to share something with you right now that I think is really cool. Thank you, Matthew. First, I'm going to begin with Scripture. Psalm 139.14, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And the reason why I use this scripture is we're going to be focusing on the five senses today. Those are gifts from our Lord. And before I share the story with you, which is going to be Seven Blind Mice by Ed Young. Um, in this story, the mice are blind, and so they can only use their sense of touch, and one uses his sense of smell to determine what they're trying to figure out they find at the pond. And a fun way to do this would be to begin with the blindfold, and I shared with Matthew, I did use red and white. Which, yeah, use, which I appreciate. That's yeah, NC State sure, red right, right, right there, right? yes. And put this on your child, and then you can each give each child their own bag or one at a time. They, these are some items that you could put in the bag that they'll just use their sense of touch to determine what it is, like a cup maybe a ball cap, some glasses, wooden spoon, pencil. And these are items that all children should recognize. I wouldn't put something in there that they might not know. Um, and that way they use their sense of touch to determine 
what is in the mystery bag. They have brothers and sisters. They could have a contest right here to see who who can guess what's in there. I mean, they they would love that. Yes, and that would be a lot of fun to do that with them. And this is simple, just old grocery bag and things you have at home. And I'm going to share the story with you now. Story time. Story time. Um, And if you don't have this book, there's many versions of it on YouTube that you can do this same lesson with your child, and you'll be able to use the YouTube books if you don't have it, or the YouTube lesson. One day, seven blind mice were surprised to find a strange something by their pond. What is it, they cried, and they all ran home. On Monday... Red Mouse went first to find out. It's a pillar, he said. No one believed him. On Tuesday, Green Mouse set out. He was the second to go. It's a snake, he said. No, said Yellow Mouse on Wednesday. It's a spear. He was the third in turn. The fourth was Purple Mouse, and he went on Thursday. Now, you got to figure at this point, little kids are are making guesses, right? They are. Yeah. (laughs) It's a great cliff, he said. And then Orange Mouse went on Friday, the fifth to go. It's a fan, he cried. I felt it move. The sixth to go was Blue Mouse. He went on Saturday and said, it's nothing but a rope. But the others didn't agree, and they began to argue. A snake, a rope, a fan, a cliff, until on Sunday, White Mouse, the seventh mouse, went to the pond. When she came upon the something, she ran up one side, and she ran down the other side, and she ran across the top and from end to end. Ah, said White Mouse, now I see. The something is as sturdy as a pillar, supple as a snake, wide as a cliff, sharp as a spear, breezy as a fan, stringy as a rope, but altogether the something is, and this is where the kids will say, oh, please keep going, what is it? But this is a great time to do a writing activity. This is called sketch to stretch. And in each block, your child would use each, each block here to depict the perspe- perspective of each mouse. So what, what did the mouse discover on Monday? What did the second mouse discover on Tuesday? What did the third mouse discover on Wednesday, fourth on Thursday, and then Friday and Saturday? And now what I would have you do is have your child infer what the entire picture might be. They're going to guess and, and determine what they think it could be. Then have your child write a paragraph about what it might be. If it's a younger child, they can dictate to you what they think it is and you can write it down. For older children, they could write a short paragraph or a story about what it is. Then you would have everybody share. And then once they've done that, then you can finish the story. Now, Chrissy, can I I ask Mm -hmm. a question before you do that? So just to clarify... Somebody takes and, and makes something like this. And so you're, you're working with your kid at home. Are they drawing in these blocks? Yes. And so they're not going to mind this. I mean, they're, right, they're right. not doing a lot of writing now. They're, draw, no. they're drawing. So what's the power of that? I mean, they're taking a picture and then, and then using that first to inspire. First sequencing to de- determine what happened first, second, third, fourth, fifth. And then also the perspective of each mouse. They're taking one part. So um, the first mouse He believed that it was a pillar. So you would draw a pillar on Monday. And then the second one, he went out and he said it was a snake. 
and so, and so as forth. they do that, mm -hmm. they're, they're thinking through the elements of the story. Right. They're getting the sequence. They're getting the rhythm. And they're giving themselves a platform to write from, right? So that they are, they're triggered to write by the time it's time to put and words on And also first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, right. seventh. And um, also um, colors for younger children. There's a lot that can be sure. incorporated into this. Um, a lot of fun. Kids, you know, they love to draw and they can use this as a springboard for writing because they can use their writing from hearing the story or reading the story to their drawing to writing. So it's a natural progression for them and it makes it a lot more fun. So finally, the seventh mouse determined that it was an elephant. And when the other mice ran up one side and down the other across the something from end to end, they agreed. Now they saw it too. The mouse moral Knowing in part may make a fine tale, but wisdom comes from seeing the whole. Which is, is a pretty higher level kind of moral, which gives you a chance to go back and, and talk about something that's deeper, right? right. What, what do we learn from that and, and what does it mean? Believe it or not, I did this with an adult Sunday school class one time. We were reading a story in the book of Genesis. I gave them all a sheet mm -hmm. of paper and I told them as we read, we paused maybe four times, add to your picture what you think God wants us to understand, a picture that illustrates what God wants us to understand from this. And the adults loved it. I mean, absolutely loved it. There's just, there is a higher order something where you are taking information and synthesizing it. And being right? creative and, like you said, and, the higher order thinking skills. And I've done similar activities like this with my students, and they did love it. And you could even, if you once you do the sketch to stretch, you wouldn't have to do it this large. But you could, for younger children, cut it apart, and they can make their own little booklet. So that would be a fun thing for them to do, and then they could retell the story. Elementary school teachers are the best <laughs> because they're always so creative and they, they always have ways to, to make things fun. Now, if you're watching and you're saying, well, my, my child is, is maybe a little too old for this book. I don't know if they are or not, but, but if you think they are, let me, let's talk about really quickly just some, some quick strategies. And let, let me give you a for instance. One of the reasons when I was teaching some older kids, one of the reasons that struggling readers didn't like to read is because they the books that they could read well fluently they felt like were too primary and they wanted to read the things that the other kids were reading right i mean mm -hmm. they they wanted to read harry potter they right. right and so we would make a deal sometimes where they would finish something that they could that they could handle um, fluently and then we would do books on tape at that time, but you, you can mm -hmm. find this, you can find audio books all over the internet now with one stipulation. I would tell them anything you want to read on the condition that you touch each word on the page as you're hearing it. And there's just something that happens to kids as they are touching, hearing, seeing. I mean, all of your senses are firing. And it was a tremendous success. I think I taught myself to read when I was a kid with books on, <laughs> uh, on, on record. You know, have you, is there a, a strategy or something that you've tried with, with older kids or struggling readers that, or writers? Um, find something that they like. I mean, always find, for older students, find something that they're interested in because then they'll be vested in what they're right. learning about and they're more interested in than to give them something that they're not interested in. So for older children, let them, let them choose the books. And we used to have, we had classroom libraries for our younger students and to have that in your home and books that they can read or go to the library when we have yeah. it open again. <laughs> but the, the internet is such a game yes. changer in this. I mean, it, it, Scribd, S-C-R-I-B-D, is, it is not very expensive and filled with books and audio books. Here's, a, here's another thing you could do. Find art online. This, was, this used to be one of my favorite ways to help mm -hmm. kids write. Find art. Find a great landscape and set a fairy tale in them. Have, have, have a child look at that picture and set a fairy tale there. Find a great portrait and have them write a diary entry of, right. about, about something that, that happened to that person. Have them write a puppet show. I mean, what kids don't love puppet Get them shows? excited about it. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Or what a great time to write a letter to somebody. Giving kids a reason to create is, is so much better. I mean, giving them something that, that makes them want to create. Because let's face it, as adults, it would be hard for any of us to sit down and then somebody say, okay, write. Right. Right. But so we need to give them a, a platform. I think Ms. Weather was giving you a great one. And we're going to come back next week and, and maybe give you some more tips on, on a different area of, of your learning. We're going to talk math next week. 
But, but for today, I just want to say that if we can help you here, if there, if there is a way that we can help you, we have access to a lot of teachers in our church. One, one and thing, administrators in yes, that were we teachers, do. yes. One thing that's for sure around here, we've got a lot of expertise, and we would be happy to connect you with a teacher who can, can help you think through what to do. So um, let us know. Reach out if, if you need us. Matthew at Pinedale.Church is how you can reach me, and I know how to meet, reach Ms. Weatherly. <laughs> so... Um, I hope you'll let us know if we can help. Thank you so much, Ms. Weatherly. Thank you. This was thank you. this was great. This was fun.